And uh, good afternoon from, uh, well, now sunny California. We had a little bit of rain. It's good to be with you. Uh, last night we had uh, the elections and uh, we had spoken previously on To the Point about Proposition 1 and it's on the ballots. Well, it, it, it won uh, or was approved, I should say, um, by an overwhelming majority. I didn't look at the, the statistics uh, this morning. But it was overwhelmingly passed, and that was an amendment to the California Constitution uh, to include um, reproductive rights and uh, abortion. But I want to rewind kind of the clock, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, I want to rewind the clock about a week um, to something that happened last week. And in preparation for these midterm elections, President Biden uh, spoke to a an overflowing and very uh, excited, rambunctious uh, crowd. Uh, he was in Florida. And during his speech, uh, the president reiterated his unfailing support of abortion. This uh, by itself isn't a surprise to me. It shouldn't surprise you as well. Um, what is surprising, though, is the reason the president gave. The, the president said that, that we can all agree. We're going to get into the quotes. I'm going to read his speech portions of it, um, paragraphs, not snippets. I'm trying to keep everything in context and, uh, we'll link, oh, it's already in there for you guys. Harmony linked the speech, uh, there from the, from the white house website. So I want to make sure that you guys know I'm not taking things out of context. That's, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to erect straw men or, or caricatures. I want to address the arguments, but this is the, the president said that, that we all can agree he literally says this. He says, we can all agree. No one knows precisely when human life begins that's how he justifies his support of roe v wade that's how he justifies his support of abortion uh, is is the president correct though and, and 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 how do you respond to the justification this kind of justification for abortion and those are the questions that we're going to be talking about and hopefully answering i know that we're going to answer them uh, this week on to the point i'm john noise for stand the reason if you're watching this is to the point and i want to read from you uh the, the transcript of the president's speech uh, this happened on november 1st so about a week ago what's that a, a week and a day ago eight days ago um it's posted on the whitehouse.gov website and it's linked to like i said here and there's a lot going on here so so let me just interact with the president's words as recorded i'm going to read them exactly as they are and they don't always uh, make sense i'm going to try to do my best um, they don't always make sense because there's uh, audience participation and stuff like this. So anyways, uh, he, he says this when I debated Bork and, and he's referring to uh, a former judge, Judge Bork, uh, as some of you may remember, he makes the joke. Now, President Biden says 100 years ago I in, and there's laughter from the crowd. And then now it picks up. It says, I said to Judge Bork, this is what Biden said, the, the difference between you and I, let me be clear, is I believe I have all the rights I possess merely because I'm a child of God, not because the Constitution gave them me. This is the president's words. He goes on to say right away, because I have them. What the Constitution did, Biden says, is the Constitution guaranteed those rights. Now, as I'm reading this, you're probably thinking this is a really interesting thing for the president to say, especially in light of his position on abortion and especially in light of what comes next. You see the president, he's saying that human beings, they possess unalienable rights. He's clear here. These rights aren't given to us by the government or any authority, but by God. And and, and that's what makes them inalienable, right? If, if the government is what gives us rights, the government can take those rights away. And now I assume President Biden, as he's saying this, and during his debate with Bork, I'm assuming that, that he would have included, and he still includes the right to life as one of those rights but let's keep going here in the president's uh, speech and, and uh, just bear with me as we dig in because this is important to listen to the president this is the president of the united states and this is what he's saying he's saying uh president biden he goes on to say and there's a thing called the ninth amendment and the ninth amendment was was all about saying basically anything that is not mentioned as existing is retained by the people not by the government retained by the people. And now I want to pause here for a second because this is important. I think oftentimes we don't 
uh, dig into what the, the Constitution actually says. And the Ninth Amendment, just so we're clear, the Ninth Amendment was James Madison's attempt to ensure that the Bill of Rights wasn't seen as as granting to the citizens of the Republic any specific rights listed in the Bill of Rights. You see, the fear was, and, and just do a little bit of research on the Ninth Amendment, the fear was that, that, that people expressly protecting certain rights that are guaranteed, the ones listed in the Bill of Rights, would be given permission to infringe on other rights, those rights not listed in the Bill of Rights. And this is an interesting point. And the reason why I'm bringing up, and this is a, an aside to our conversation, but I think it's important. It's an interesting point because the Ninth Amendment says one person's rights shouldn't violate another person's rights. And, 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 and there's a reason that the, the Supreme Court, they didn't appeal to this amendment in the Roe opinion. And, and I think it has to do with the idea that, that they knew that there were two human beings and, and, and in the instance of a pregnant mother and in the instance of abortion, and therefore there were two sets of rights, and they want to get into that issue. So, so that's just kind of an aside, but these things are important to, to dig into the, uh, to the Constitution and understand what this is, what he's, what they're actually saying. And, and President Biden's a lawyer first, you know, and, and um, anyways, picking back up in the, in the speech, there's a lot to talk about. I don't want to go way over time here. Uh, he, he says this, he says Roe versus Wade, and this is really where it gets interesting for us. He says Roe versus Wade didn't satisfy everyone. And this is, he says, I'm a practicing Catholic. I've supported Roe versus Wade. And there, this is where he gives the reason. And the reason I support Roe versus Wade is the, the most rational basis upon which confessional faiths can agree. No one knows precisely when does human life begin. And then he says life, uh, pregnancy rather, pregnancy, it's an inaudible pregnancy. If you watch it, you can kind of make it out the words. Pregnancy, he says, is broken into three trimesters. It made sense. It made sense on who was what authority under what circumstances. Again, these are the president's words, so I'm just trying to read them exactly as they are in the transcript. And yet, you have now these candidates out there talking about they they well, you know, the decisions should be made between woman, her doctor, and and local elected officials. And then there's laughter from the crowd, as you stated. Uh, right, Charlie. He's talking to Charlie Crist. Not. That's not hyperbole. And and so this is still Biden. And so look, folks, there's a lot at stake, a whole lot at stake. So let's dig into these words. So the, so the rationale of, of, of the president is since we don't know when life begins, we should have the right to uh, abortion on demand. Well, Mr. President, I don't expect this to fall into your eyes. And, and, I, and, and this is with all due respect, you are completely mistaken. You're, you're mis you, you mistake uh, results, and, and I'm sorry, but your mistake results in, in the death of millions of human beings. You know, first, even, even if what you're saying is true in life, and we don't know when life starts, and, and, and we don't uh, know when that actual uh, first uh, sign of life is, how does it follow that, that we should be able to destroy it? If we don't know when life begins, shouldn't we err on the side of caution then? Shouldn't we protect that thing until we know whether it's it's alive or not? Nevertheless, the, the unborn is a human being and, and it's alive. You know, the science of embryology proves the unborn is alive. It, it, it's, it's a living being, a unique individual being. Um, it's, it's different from the mother. It's a, it's a human being, not a potential human being either or, or some other type of being. It's, it's a new human life that, that comes into existence when two living gametes, the sperm and the egg, fuse to form a living zygote. And there, there's no period of non-life, by the way. And, and, and the unborn is, is growing. And, and, and all that's needed for the living being to continue to grow is, is, is exactly the same thing that adult humans need. Nutrition and proper environment. And, and, and this is the problem, right? This is, this is why people feel the need to have an abortion because there's something in them. There's a life in them growing and alive and it needs to be aborted before it's born. You see, if it wasn't alive, it wouldn't need to be aborted. The unborn, and by the way, uh, Mr. President, it, it meets the, the biological criteria for life. It grows, it, it, it responds to stimuli, it metabolizes nutrients. The, the unborn is a unique individual human being, not merely part of the mother's body. And then the unborn, it has its own uh, DNA. It has its own uh, fingerprints. It has its own circulatory system, its own blood type, its own brain functions, its own gender. The unborn, it can have, it can have a, a different race or ethnicity than its mother. 
So the unborn is a unique individual, not merely part of the mother's body, but, but what kind of being is it? <laughs> well, it's not an elephant. It's, it's, it's not a dolphin. It's not a hamster. It's not a dog. It's a human being. So the unborn is, is first, it's living. Second, it's unique. And third, it's, it's a human. Even, uh, even abortion advocates agree life begins at conception. And, and pay attention, Christian, as, as we're going through this, because this is our ammunition. This is how we respond. The debate is no longer whether or not uh, the, an abortion takes the life of a, of a human being. Everybody knows, including scientists, that, that life starts at conception. We're going to get to that. But right now, let's look at some skeptics, some people critical of, of our position, some people who support abortion. Uh, Faye Whittleton, the, the long, she, said she was the longest reigning president of, of Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion business in the United States. And she argued as far back as 1997 that everyone already knows that abortion kills. She she proclaims the following in an interview with, uh, with Miss Magazine, and, and you can find this interview online if you search it. She says, and I quote, I think we've deluded ourselves into believing that people don't know that abortion is killing. So any pretense that abortion is not killing is a sign of our ambivalence, a sign that we cannot say, yes, it kills a fetus. Uh, the, 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 um, and... Uh, Purity, uh, author, and, and she's the former chief executive of the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. And this is the UK's largest independent abortion provider. This is like the Planned Parenthood of, of what we have here overseas, over the pond, right? And, and, and she says, we can, we can accept that the embryo is a living thing, the fact that it has a beating heart, that it has its own genetic system within it. It's clearly human in the sense that it's not a gerbil and we can recognize that it's a human life. This is in her abortion, the civilized debate, uh, battle of ideas. And you can, again, you can find this debate from November 1st, 2008. Now let's look at some medical textbooks and, and, and medical testimony as to, as to when human life begins, Mr. President. If, if, if what you're saying is true, then all of these experts, first advocates for abortion, now these scientists, these embryologists who are literally writing the books that our doctors are studying from, they must be mistaken, not you. So Keith Moore in Before We Were Born says this, this, he's referring to a zygote, this zygote formed by the union of an oocyte and a sperm is the beginning of a new human being, i.e. An, an embryo. You know, Ronan O'Reilly and, and uh, Fabulia, it's, it's F-O-B-I-A-L-A, Mueller, in Human Embryology and Tetralogy, they say this, although life is a continuous process, fertilization is critical is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is formed when the chromosomes of, of the male and the female pre pronuclei blend in the oocyte. Okay, these aren't my words. These are experts. T.W. Sadler uh, and uh, in, in Longman's em Embryology. These are textbooks that are being used in medical schools around the world. Uh, Sadler says this, development begins with fertilization and the, the process by which the male gamete and the sperm and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite to give rise to a zygote. David Boonin, um, he he works at the now uh, he wrote uh, Defense of Abortion. He works at University of Colorado Boulder. No no friend of ours in this discussion. He's pro-abortion, and like, I mean he literally wrote the book, A Defense of Abortion. Right? He says perhaps the most straightforward relation between you and me on the one hand and every human fetus from conception onward on the other is this: all are living members of the same species, Homo sapiens. A human fetus, after all, is simply a human being at a very early stage in his or her development. Doesn't stop there. Peter Singer, most of you guys might know this name. He's largely considered one of the most influential moral philosophers of our time. And he's worked at a number of universities, including Oxford and uh, some of the very best in this country. And in his book, Practical Ethics, he says this, there's no doubt that from the first moment of its existence, an embryo conceived from a human sperm and egg is a human being. And the same is true of the most profoundly and in irreparably intellectually disabled human being, even of an infant who's born uh, anacephalic, anacephalic, literally without a brain. He argues that these things are human beings. So, so, so President Biden, you're, you're wrong. 
<laughs> in, in your facts. You need to reconsider your position in light of that. But also, I, but I would point out that, that President Biden, you're right about two things. First, every human being is worthy of basic human rights, in, including the right to life. You said that. The president said that. He said that uh, years and years ago, as he says, 100 years ago in his debate with Bork, but he said it last week. Every human being is worthy of life. So why then is, is he discriminating against an entire population of human beings allowing for their extermination? Second thing that, that, that the president is right about is, is there's a whole lot at stake here. Innocent human life. That's what's at stake. That's what's at stake during these elections, and that's, a, that's what's at stake as we, uh, as we seek to influence the culture around us. This is why it's important that we are trained up, that we know the truth about what living human beings are, uh, what, what uh, the, the unborn are. That's the fundamental question. What is the unborn? You see, if, if it's not a living human being, the, the, then the president is right. Then, then you know no, no justification for abortion is needed. But if it is a living human being, no justification for abortion is adequate. No justification is adequate for abortion if what's inside that mother is a living human being. And it seems to me like science says it is a living human being. And that's why the travesty of, of, well, of these elections, right? The, this is my voter guide, right? That's why uh, the Proposition 1 that just was passed in California is a travesty. That's why when I look at these uh, these results that are rolling in, a lot of the people who are elected aren't, uh, aren't aware or, or ignorant or unwilling to weigh the evidence, and I think the president is one of them. So uh, we need to be calling these people to repentance. We need to be uh, engaged in a way that's winsome and effective, and we need to be ambassadors for Christ, begging on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5.20. So with that, guys, that's uh, to the point. And I'm going to scroll through here and, and see some interactions and see what we got going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look down because my computer's here. Uh, my camera's here. So, uh, so let's see what we got. And I'm going to start up at the top like I, I normally do. And hopefully, if you have questions um, and you haven't asked it already, uh, put questions in, in the comment question in bold, and it'll stand out for me. Uh, I grieve for Californians, California voters who approve the Constitution. Yep. So, Rick, it, I w I'm not surprised by this. Uh, I'm just not, unfortunately. I was kind of surprised last I checked. I wonder if I can uh, if I can look at it real quick. I never do this with you guys. Actually, I did it last time. I said I never do this, but I wonder if I can. Um, prop one and see uh california 2022 yeah so it passed uh 42 percent of the vote is reporting as of right now 65 percent to 35 percent so three million uh 483,942 people voted in favor of prop one to uh to amend the California Constitution to include the right uh, to abortion um, in this state. It's uh, it's sad, uh, and we should grieve, but it should cause us not to uh, become reclusive. It should cause us not to just get, go into our circles, and then and but it should cause us to go out into the community and start making the case. So this is this is why I've argued it here before and other to the points when when. Um, when Dobbs came out, when the when the court last year, well, earlier this year, ruled on Dobbs, that wasn't the end. That was the beginning for us. So now we need to we need to take these results and we need to to understand we have a lot of work to be doing, and uh, and be out there making the case for life, defending the unborn, for for who they are, uh, image bearers, and and holding the president accountable to his words. He, he argues that that rights aren't given to us by the state. They're not given to us by the government. They're given to us by God, and they're unalienable. And, and one of those inalienable rights is the right to life. The basic right is right to life. So if every human being, Mr. President, is guaranteed the right to life, as you've argued in the past, why then are you committing atrocities on people, on human beings in their mother's womb? Repent. Repent, turn from your kid ways, defend the most vulnerable in our culture and in our society, because uh, history says that that's how societies will be judged. And, uh, and I can tell you, certainly the government of California is not passing 
uh, that test. So anyways, we do grieve, but it, it motivates me. There's a lot of work to be doing. It's job security for me, I guess, you know, um, let's see this here. Uh, Isaac, thank you, uh, Rick, by the way, for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Uh, there's uh, Oregon bill um, ballot measure, which amends affordable health care as a fundamental right. Yeah, I read this comment because you commented this before. You commented, you, you added this comment before the, the stream started. Uh, there has to be a discussion as to what is constituted, what constitutes a, a fundamental right? What constitutes a fundamental right? Um, because I'm not sure healthcare is, is, I think, I think healthcare for everybody is a good thing, by the way, let's, let's be consistent and be honest. If people are made in the image of God, if people are valuable and unique, we should, we should, if we can afford it, give the people the, give people the best care that we can possibly do. Certainly we need to figure something out with healthcare. I mean, we have to, uh, it's, it's a mess as far as I'm concerned. And, but, but is it a fundamental, right? Oh, that's a discussion that we should have, you know? That could, but but you point out that could mean abortion also for those who think abortion is healthcare. And abortion is the opposite. We've said this not, I think last time, maybe maybe on the last to the point of one before that, abortion is not healthcare. It's the opposite of healthcare. It's the intentional taking of an innocent human life. It's murder. So so let's not let's not uh dilute the issue, dilute the issue and, and by by calling it healthcare. It's not healthcare. Healthcare is, is what it sounds like. It's providing care to an individual for a healthy life. Abortion is the exact opposite of that. And it's not reproductive rights either, as, as the California Constitution will now say, or reproductive freedom. Reproductive rights stops at the moment of reproduction. <laughs> I've discussed this on a previous to the point. I pointed to Alan Schleeman has a fantastic article on this as well. It, it's not reproductive uh, freedom. It's not a reproductive right. Reproductive rights stop after the the after reproduction happens, and abortion is the taking of that life that is the result of reproduction. So I think it's important that that we be clear on uh, on what we're talking about and not uh, let uh, rhetoric win the day, but actually the merits of the arguments. Um, here's a link to the transcript, guys. I started earlier. Thank you, Harmony, for putting this up. Uh, it's, it, I said this in the last to the point or, or a couple times ago when we were talking about uh, the, 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 um, uh, the sex ed curriculum in schools. It's really important that, that we not trust like, so just to throw this out here, guys, I read uh, this, this issue came to me, actually Harmony sent me an article. It was like, maybe you want to talk about this. It was a, uh, it was a conservative news outlet that quoted what I just read to you, a portion of it, the, the portion about Biden saying that. Um, that he, he can support Roe v. Wade because we can all agree that life doesn't start, that we don't know when life starts. So that was that, that quote, which I just paraphrased was included in an article on a, on a very conservative, uh, news site. Well, I clicked the link that it linked me to where they said the speech came from. And it was, uh, it was a speech in Florida that they linked me to. And I watched the whole thing. I watched the 35 minutes of, of President Biden speaking and not anywhere in that 35 minutes did he say what that conservative news outlet reported he said. That's concerning. So like then what I did is I took the quote and I, and I Googled that. And that's why I'm putting the link to the exact transcript via the White House website because he did say that, but it wasn't in that speech. It was in a speech that happened a couple of days earlier and the one that I linked to. And we just need to be careful. Why I'm bringing this up is because we can't just trust one. We can't just trust the news sources that we want to trust, even if they're conservative, even if they're a Christian news source. Do your own research. You know, if something like you should be clicking on the links and making sure that actually uh, what what news outlets are saying or said is said. And in this case, it was said, but just from a different speech. But anyways, this is the the link that you guys can click on and actually read it for yourself. Don't take my words for it. I read it. And then there's a larger portion there. It's a really interesting discussion. If you can, t if you have the time to take the, I guess the, the, the rabbit trail into the ninth amendment and the 14th amendment. And he talks about Clarence Thomas and his language uh, centered around another Supreme court case, which involved uh, contraception. It's actually an interesting, there's a lot of interesting things that happens, especially in the seventies, right at the same time, uh, that same court, Roe v. Wade was decided. There were two other cases, one in particular that had to do with abortion that was and 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 uh, re, um, uh, contraception use, which was really interesting. And the way that the court argues, I think, is important to understand. And what, the way they don't argue is important to understand these things. But that's a, a rabbit trail for another time. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, Isaac, you kind of confirmed what I just what I just found. Yeah, the amendment passed with sixty five percent, and not even half the the half the 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 ballots have been counted yet. So I'm, I don't know. Maybe that'll go up. I have no idea. You uh, here's uh, I blame the Supreme Court that did not give all equal protection under the law. Yeah, Brian. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. You know, I um. <laughs> I, I want to agree with you on, on the initial, like on the merits right here, like right away. I'm like, yeah, you know, the Supreme Court, they should have, what they should have done is I wish that they took up, there was a, there's a chance there was a case that was, that was brought to them on appeal that they turned down. They refused to hear this session that would have uh, defined human, like what it means to be human being, um, which I think is where most of the conversation needs to be is, is what is a human being and, and personhood and all of this stuff uh that the courts could have taken up and, and weighed in on but but let's remember guys that the, the the that the government doesn't give us our our fundamental rights no court gives us our fundamental rights our fundamental rights are, are derived from god and it's up to us to hold our governments accountable to that standard by what standard is the question that we need to be asking when when we're talking about this stuff like where do we get our rights from what's the standard of right and wrong here because it's not what our government says. It's what God says. And when the government is standing in, in direct conflict with what God says, there should be a tension there. And it should cause us to move into the discussion and cause us to call our government to repentance um, when need be. And that's something that I just don't see happening. Um, so yeah, good good point, Brian. Thanks for watching, man. Um, and Harmony, you're doing a great job because you're incredible. Harmony's our uh, social media expert i don't know what your title is harmony but you're rad um let's see here that's like demolishing a building not knowing if there are people inside this is yes paul yes see okay so so the the argument even if the argument even if it was true what the president's saying what president biden said eight days ago in front of thousands of people and and, and now recorded on the government's uh the the government's website the whitehouse.org or gov website uh what he argued even if it's true that we don't know when life starts, how does it then follow that we should be able to 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 to, to perform abortions? You know, I, I look at it this way: like, say you're driving down a road. This is the example I'll give it during my abortion talk if the issue comes up. Um, I, I do in a talk called "Abortion uh, Make Abortion Unthinkable" or "Abortion Made Un uh, Unthinkable," and uh, I'd love to come to your church and present it. It's one of my. It's one of my. I, favorite talks is not necessarily probably the right word, but it's one of the ones that I think has the most impact. And so anyways, what I say is I'll, I'll draw this out. Say you're driving home and it's raining. Last night it was raining pretty hard where I live. And, uh, and in the road, you see, you see a, a, a clump of something when it rains here in Southern California, just so you know, like we're not used to it. So like we have like slot landslides. And even on my, my really residential street, uh, the, you know, the mulch from people's yards runs into the street and there's clumps in the road. And, and most of the time it's dirt. And most of the time it's mulch or plants that kind of drifted away into the street. So say you're driving down the street in, in the pouring rain and you see a clump of something in the street and, and you think maybe it might've moved, but that could just be the water carrying it or it could like, do you intentionally swerve to hit it or do you try to kind of go to the side of it? Well, I always go to the side of it. Why? Cause I don't know what it is. So I don't want to, I don't want to damage my car. I don't want to damage it. And if I'm certainly, if I'm thinking, oh, wait a second, that thing might be moving. I'm going to go by it slowly and I'm going to wait to see to, to, to make sure. Oh wait. Cause what if it's like a kid, you know, what if it's something that's hurt at a hurt animal or one of my neighbor's dogs, you know, if it's my neighbor's dog, I'm going to get outside and I'm going to, I'm going to help it. I'm going to, I'm going to pick it up. If it's a kid, certainly if it's a child, I'm certainly gonna gonna stop and, and make sure. But if it's a clump of dirt, fine. I'm gonna swerve around it. I'm gonna leave it where it's at. I'm gonna leave it right where it's is, and I'm gonna keep going. But <laughs> we don't even have to think about that because Biden's dead wrong on this issue. Life starts at the moment of conception. Yes, this is supported through the biblical data, right? This is supported through biblical data, but it's also supported through scientific data. Science of embryology has proven this without a doubt. This is not a valid argument. There are other, are, there are other arguments for abortion, right? A personhood uh, theory. There's also um, a, a, a woman, Thompson. Uh, she she came up in the in the 70s or 80s with the the violinist, the famous violinist 
thing where a violin, a famous violinist is attached to somebody. And so you don't have a right to, to attach yourself to somebody. And, but so these are the bodily autonomy stuff. You know, these, these are different arguments for abortion, but certainly nobody's arguing that it's not a living human, human being. No way. Um, so the president's wrong. And even if we don't know that it's not living yet, we should take care of it. Um, let's see here. Stand the reason. Question. Here we go, Isaac. Thank you, man. Isaac. How should we represent Christ and respect authority when our state legislation passed laws such as California Reproductive? We should be bringing these, these things to the forefront. It, it, it's we, we should be having these discussions with, with our neighbors and, and the people around us. We should be bringing them to the politicians. Go to your uh, local politicians. Write to them. You know, uh, we, have, we have these options available to us. But I feel like we almost never take take advantage of them. You know, if, if you're inclined, run for office. But hold true to biblical principles. It almost makes you unelectable, certainly here in California. I've, I've literally thought about this before. I've like, you know what? Maybe I should run for office. You know, I, 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 did a, I lived a long time in Washington, D.C. I used to be heavily involved in politics because I just enjoy it. It's a fun thing for me. You know, and oh, maybe I should just like, run for office something and no one was going to elect me because I'm a Christian and I, and I would run on those values and I'm unwavering because there's no compromise, right? There's no neutrality. You're the former you're against me. It's right. Christ says. So, so I don't think I'm electable, but like, I think that you can influence things, but, um, and, and I, I, I've said it here uh, before and I'll say it again, that the change comes incrementally. Very rarely does large scale cultural change happen overnight. It happens, but it's rare. It starts incrementally. It starts with conversations around the water cooler. It starts with, uh, you know, um, standing up for your, for for what what your freedoms that God has given you. It, it, it exercising your freedom of speech. And it starts with educating our children on these issues and talking to them about them and and not wavering and not saying, oh, you know, don't talk about this, Sally. You know, this is this is too controversial. No, it it, ta- it starts with you know having those conversations around Thanksgiving table. Right, the dinner table where where our, maybe our our friends and our family might disagree with us, and we don't want to be uh, that weird Christian. Well, we're ambassadors for Christ. It's not uh, at all times when it's not something we turn off and on. It's uh, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, and so what we need to become is informed, and then we need the, the, the you know uh, knowledge, wisdom, character. Right, those are the three pillars at STR: knowledge, wisdom, character. Be informed about the issues. Have be wise. Be shrewd. Know uh, how to engage and when it is appropriate to engage. And character, you know, live a life that that is exemplary of Christ that people can point to and say, "Yeah, that's a good person right there." They 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 follow Jesus, or that's a good person. I don't agree with their worldview, but you know, at least they they're consistent. And that's important too. Consistency is super important when we talk about politics. So many times, guys, I see, and this is just like kind of me going off here, but so many times I see Christians. Um, be Christian, good Christians, right? And they get so involved in politics that then all of a sudden we become inconsistent. So we support things through our voting that doesn't line up necessarily with our worldview. You know, certainly with how we view people and and as as image bearers, regardless of where they're from. I think immigration we could look at, you know, uh, better. I think uh, the, the justice system. I think we could look at that better from a Christian perspective. And have influence on it. Um, if you're a young person or you're raising students, we need we need lawyers and doctors and, and cultural influencers in these people, and then to live out their values and their Christian ethic. You know, so so like I'm I'm pushing my kids. You know, I'm, I, I, we do a lot of like homeschool stuff. So and so college isn't my goal. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 focused on 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 helping make disciples of Christ. And if college is in their future, and the Lord chooses to take them in that direction fantastic but i hope that they go and study the law and they become you know doctors or lawyers or judges and stuff like this so then they can influence the law and the things that that or politicians even i mean i don't know maybe (laughs) so that's that's how uh you know and, and and when things when things aren't right we call them out when a law like this prop one this prop one is unacceptable it's unacceptable so we should be out there and say, you know what, uh, Governor Newsom, this is not right. This is unacceptable to us. 
this is this is not right. And in California, by the way, it has the history of, of not necessarily going with the vote. <laughs> if you guys remember a number of years back now, probably what 15 years or so ago, I think it was during the midterms. Uh, it might not have been. It might have been. Might have there might have been a presidential uh, presidential election year. I can't remember, but like 15 or, or 16 years ago or 14 years ago. So, anyways, there was Prop Eight, which was a vote to which was the vote to legalize same sex marriage. And how did California vote? They turned it down. They they said no. And then what happened? Well, the courts approved it anyway. So, I mean, our vote doesn't always have the power that we think it does. So, anyway, stand up. Let let your voice be heard in a winsome and effective way. Never violence, you know. But certainly, there is going to come a point, I think, where uh, civil disobedience is uh, is warranted at the at the very least, you know. Um, I'm reading a um, now. I'm not going to be able to remember the name of it. I'm reading a great book right now. Um, Christian critical theory. I think it's called Christian critical theory, and in it, there's a great Schaefer quote about that. That that civil disobedience uh, is always an option. You know, so the, the the count the costs. I think Greg just talked about this as well. On one of his podcasts. Count the cost of being a Christian in today's day and in age. Because it does come at a cost. We shouldn't expect it not to. Because it costs God, right? It costs God. God paid an, an incredible price and he, and he did it for you and for me. Right? We are not your own, but we've been purchased at a price. So it's going to be, it's going to cost us. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? Um, oh, here's a great article by Tim Barnett. Abortion advocates uh, fail biology. <laughs> Tim does great with this stuff. Uh, you know, all the guys at STR and, and, and Amy as well. I mean, everybody at STR does such a great job. Uh, if you guys are looking for good resources, also Scott Klusendorf, Life Training Institute. Scott Klusendorf, Life Training Institute. He's coming out with his second edition of Case for Life uh, in the next couple months, I think. And uh, from what I understand, it's 40% new content. His chapters have been re reworked. It's got a number of new chapters. Uh, this is like the manual for pro-life apologetics, uh, The Case for Life by Scott Klusendorf. If you don't own it, you should. You should buy it and you should read it. But I would wait until the new version comes out or buy the old version to support him and then buy the new version to support uh, Life Training Institute because they do amazing work. Um, let's see here. Uh, Gordon, thanks for watching, man. Uh, we don't know for sure, so let's not take any chances. That's right. We don't know when life starts. So if we don't know when life starts, then we shouldn't take any chances, and we should let the let the thing be. And and the thing is, is is whenever it's let be, very quickly within a couple of weeks, it becomes very very clear what that thing is. It's a living human being, and then that's clear through uh, through genetics and then biology even before that, right at the moment of conception. And that's what we looked at. Uh, good point. Um, let's see here, Brian, you said that last week, a woman on the street and you, you guys had a conversation, um, and said, it's the, the, the men that tell women what they can and can't do with their bodies. How would you respond? I'd say, I don't, I, well, what do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm not telling you what you can or cannot do with your body, you know, but the law certainly does. We're not free to do whatever we want with our body. Even a pregnant mom, a, a, a pregnant mom isn't free to do with whatever she wants with her body. For example, there are certain drugs that doctors, even male doctors, will not prescribe to that pregnant woman because of the known risks of, uh, of birth defects, right? So there's certain drugs that, that are illegal to prescribe. You cannot do whatever you want. We do not have complete autonomy of ourselves. You know, I, and, and certainly when, when your rights uh, start to infringe on, on another human being's rights. So that's how I probably respond. I'd say, well, I understand that. And I'm not trying to tell you what you can and cannot do, but, but we are told what we can and cannot do. Don't you, don't you agree? Like we can't just go like killing people. That's murder. That's what abortion is. The argument is, is, is it's it's almost circular. It's assuming that it, there's a hidden uh, assumption there that the unborn isn't a human being. And it always comes back to that one question, what is the unborn? That's what I would bring it back to. It's like, absolutely, I'm not trying to tell you what to do with your body. You, you can do whatever you want with your body. But what exactly is the unborn? 
Because if it's a living human being, it's more complicated than this. If it's not, if it's not a human being, if, it, if it's just, if it's just a clump of cells, like people want to say, then fine, do whatever you want with it. But I think it's more than that. I think it's a, I think it's a human. I think that, that we can show uh, through, through the biblical data and the scientific data that it's a unique living human being. And here's why. And then list some of the evidence that I, that I said, and that's, that's probably how I'd go, uh, Brian. You know, it's always comes back to that question: What is the unborn? What is the unborn? And um, and there's I, I've done another uh, uh, to the point where I've mentioned. Well, the last couple have been on abortion. I feel like I've done a number of them because it's such an important issue. But um, where there's tactics like uh, trotting out the toddler, you know, so take take the excuse, the the reasons, the justifications that people use for abortion. And just instead of applying it to a, the unborn, apply it to a toddler. And you'll see that the issue isn't really the issue. The issue is what's the unborn. So, so for example, if somebody says, you know, uh, don't tell me what to do. I have the right to do with, with my body, whatever I want. Okay, I understand that. Do you have the right then to use your body to take the life of your four-year-old child? Well, no, no. Why? Well, because that's a child that that's, that's murder. Ah, so the issue really isn't bodily autonomy. The issue is, is what's the unborn, you know? And then we have to argue for the, the, why the unborn is valuable, why we know it's a human being, why we know that it's unique and, and worthy of protection. So that's how I'd go. But you could look back at some of those other things. There's also a ton on the STR website, str.org on, on, uh, on tactics on how to address these issues, but that's how I'd probably go about it. Um, oh yeah. Huh. Harmony beat me to the punch right here. A great article here. Why men can speak on abortion. And that's the other thing people are, people often say, well, you're a man. You don't have an input. Like you can't say, cause you don't know. Okay. Well, am I able to speak up against, uh, against rape or sex trafficking? Because the vast majority of rape and, and sex trafficking have, have to do with, with women. Not this is, these are, these are women's issues not men so should i just stay silent on these issues no of course not because we're talking about human beings we're talking about humanity image bearers not just uh, at a certain stage of life but in all of life so like if i can speak up on on other issues having to do with women can i speak on women's suffrage can i argue for for the right of women to have equal pay then why can I speak up about this, but I can't about abortion? And ask the questions. Don't bear the burden of proof. Ask these. Ask the. Ask your the person that you're having the discussion with. Ask them the question. Ask them that. What's the difference? What What's? Can you show me what the difference is? Is why I can. So I can defend the idea that I think women should get paid equally in the workforce. When we need equal pay for women, right? Just give them that, right? Equal pay for women. That's okay for me to say, but but I can't speak into the abortion issue. What's the difference? Because I'm a man? Hmm. Interesting. You know, and let them wrestle with that. It's important. Let's see here. Um, oh, you look at this. Yeah. Uh, Paul, great, great job, man. You made my point. Right. There are there are laws that are that are that, that control us. I mean, almost every law does says what we can and cannot do. You know, I can't drive my car on the uh on, on the wrong side of the road, you know, I can't go on, on, you know, southbound on the northbound freeway here, you know, that's illegal. Why? Because it puts people in harm's way. Um, let's see here. Let's see if there's any, any question here. Is this a video on abortion? Uh, is there a video, uh, session of abortion is unthinkable. Yes. Great question, Paul guys. This is a great opportunity. Uh, go to STRU. So, so if you go to STR backslash str.org backslash training, that's going to be bring you to STR University. Alan Schleeman just launched. Well, we just launched Alan Schleeman's course on uh, making abortion unthinkable. It's a, it's a couple part. I think it's like a four or five class course. It's fantastic. Um, you should go watch it. It's amazing. So and it's free. And uh, so you guys sign up for a login for STRU and then you have to, then you can take, you can watch the videos, you can take the quizzes and, uh, and get, get equipped that way. But fantastic resource. Robbie Lashua also just launched, um, a 
a worldview one, uh, worldview STR University. So he he looks at uh, three or four different worldviews and kind of juxtaposes them, the Christian worldview being one of them, and seeing and explaining why uh, they're not equally valid. It's worth your time, definitely. Um, go there. Yes, yes, yes. Up oh, and uh, Harmony already said that in the comments. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Uh, oh, I'm down at the end of the comments. I don't know if I've missed anybody. My screen here is a little uh, a little messed up. I'm seeing like jarbly gobbly gook gook um, in some of the comments. So if I missed your comment, I'm really sorry. Um, but there's great resources out there, guys. And uh, str.org is a great starting place. Um, also, if you can get out to one of our uh, reality apologetics conferences, we're, we're, we're speaking, of course, as always, on abortion. Uh, this week, I leave early tomorrow morning. I'm actually going to end here in a minute. And I got to go pack and uh, get some last minute odds and ends because I'm leaving early, early in the morning. So if you're praying, you can pray for travels, but also just an effective time. As of right now, I think we've got we've got more than well, well over 3,000 students signed up for this conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So this is the last one of the year, but we run these apologetics conferences according to the, the school year calendar. So they, they start in September. We take a break for uh, Christmas and New Year's, Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's, and then we'll start back up in the spring. Um, so we've got Minneapolis this weekend, which is going to be so much fun. And then uh, myself and the speaking team at STR, we travel to um, Denver, straight from Minneapolis. We'll be in Denver, Colorado for the Evangelical Theological Society meeting, ETS. If you guys are uh, theological nerds, you probably know what that is. It's a huge conference, the world's largest, I think. Uh, theological conference. So we gather as kind of a team. It's a great chance. Uh, I'm not presenting at that. Alan is presenting at EPS, Evangelical Philosophical Society, uh, the day after, and so is Greg. Um, but I'm not presenting, so it's kind of just a time to sit and soak and get some fellowship. There's a couple talks on actually justice that I'm really looking forward to hearing, uh, taking some notes, coming back informed, seeing kind of like what the what's going on in the you know the theological sphere out there and and. Uh, and, and get uh, get better equipped so that we can be better ambassadors. So we're going to go there. And then um, then we take, like I said, the holidays off. Then we pick up with Reality Conference. Um, we'll be in Dallas in uh, February. Then from there, I think we go to Augusta. It's actually North Augusta. Um, we're there in March. And then April, we go up to Philadelphia. So if you're in those areas... Uh, make sure you come out and tickets will sell out just so you know uh, dallas is is a really big church where uh, cottonwood creek church in, outside of dallas it's in allen texas i believe it's like 45 minutes and outside or half hour outside of dallas it's a beautiful church i love going there um and that's a pretty big church and it's going to sell out it holds a couple thousand uh the other churches uh the one in georgia is is i think going to sell out too and uh, Philadelphia, I'm sure it is. I think they sold out they pretty close last year. So if you want tickets for those, I think you can already uh, pre-register. Uh, it's fairly affordable. So you just go to realityapologetics.com, and that's where you can go. We're, we're hitting up the, the culture of doubt. We're hitting up uh, these deconversion stories. That's what the theme is. And it's a great time. We're having a ball. Um, so what, what else do I have? Harmony, do I have any other? Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Um. Oh, wait, there's a question. I got a question. Yay. That's standard reason question. Hey, John, how can I argue that the unborn are persons protected under the Constitution as well as human beings? So this is the personhood trick. This is a legal trick that 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 people try to use. They try to draw a distinction between what a person is and and what a, and a human being is. And and we de I, I deny that distinction. All human beings are persons. Because when somebody brings this up, what they're trying to do is they're trying to put something on top of being a human to assign value to that human being. So it's not good enough just to be a human. You now have to become a person. Peter Singer and these some of these other people argue like this, right? And Peter Singer says that you don't become a person for like two years old. So he argues for infanticide. He argues that you should be able to take the life of a, of a, of a two-year-old kid. 
because they're not yet a person. And what he does is he justifies that by uh, by ascribing you have to have certain qualities. Um, they used to say, or some of the arguments are, uh, you can feel pain, conscious, so you can think on your own. Um, and, and the common ways, and this is what we've taught on SLED, right? So so the way that we combat the, the personhood argument, personhood theory, is we talk about SLED, uh, size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency. Size, level of in- development, environment, degree of dependency. So our size isn't what gives us value, right? So, so we're going to say, well, they're not a person yet because they're just a, they're just a single-celled per, like human being. Therefore, they're not a person not big enough yet. Well, if, if I'm big, uh, so I'm pretty big. I'm 6'3", like 240-ish right now. I'm a pretty big dude. Am I more valuable than my five-year-old? No. Well, then why do, why do we say the same thing? Why do we say uh, why do we say the opposite for for a, a baby in the womb? Why do we say that about a human being in the womb? You know, uh, the level of development. Um, I'm I'm more developed than my children. You know, uh, the, the 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 how does that make me more or less valuable? It doesn't. Uh, environment. I love this one, right? So so because the baby's in the womb, it's somehow it's less less valuable. Therefore, like the 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 the. the the birthing process as the baby travels down the birth canal, all of a sudden it's assigned value. How, what, what exactly gives that baby value now that it's outside of the womb? If I, if I, I'm, I'm, I, I film this in my garage. So I'm in my garage right now. And when I exit my garage, does my value change? Does it change whether I'm in my value as a human being? Does it change from wherever I travel? If I'm flying or if I'm, I mean, anywhere in, in space? No, no, it doesn't, you know, degree of dependency. Uh, what about the what, a, what the, does a baby that is that is on life support or or how about a, a somebody who gets into a car accident and they're on life support are they somehow less valuable than somebody who like you or I is just just fine without the support because we don't depend on something else to keep us alive of course not you see what what this is is this is a legal trick it, they're trying to the, the 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 people who bring up the personhood arguments are trying to say that you that you have to earn your value or your worth by some extrinsic value. And you want to know something? Uh, appeal to Dred Scott. This, this is uh this is an the the exact argument that people use to justify slavery. This is the exact argument that it, it, I feel like we bring it up all the time, so people like get numb to the fact, but this is the argument that that Nazis used uh in Nuremberg to defend themselves. You know, so, I mean, if you're willing to go down that route, fine. But history has taught us that, that, that this argument leads us to nasty places, gnarly places. So um, that's, how I, that's how I respond. Um, and I've also, I've talked about this on another To The Point, and it's written about it on the website as well. Uh, so str.org. Thanks, Howard, man. It's great to see you here. Thanks for your, all your support, bro. Um, question. Wow, I thought all the questions were gone. Um Thoughts on John Fetterman taking PA Senate race? I felt hopeless between both candidates. I don't know anything about either. I know Dr. That wasn't Dr. Oz. Like, isn't he like the famous doctor? He was on like Oprah. <laughs> like, I have no idea what qualifies him to be a politician. I don't know. And this guy, the Fetterman guy, I've, I've, I don't know anything about them. I know that the, the, the press, at least, you know, the algorithms on my phone, like that Google uses or Facebook uses to give me articles, say disparaging things about Mr. Fetterman. But uh, I saw his acceptance speech last night. He seemed like a, I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about him. So don't, don't hammer me. He seemed like a good dude. His, his wife seemed to love him very much. He's got cute little kids. I don't know. I don't know anything about him. I'm sure that him and I differ on probably every, uh, not every, a lot of policies, I'm sure. I don't know anything about him. So, but I also don't know anything about Dr. Oz. I mean, it's Dr. Oz. I don't know. It's like, that's a tough, <laughs> that's a tough, that's a tough ticket right there for me. I mean, that's like, holy smokes, man. Like, what are we doing? Um, yeah. Uh, since they allow abortions and think the state should have, should not have a say. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm assuming Fetterman, Fetterman is, is uh, pro-abortion. I'm assuming Dr. Oz ran as a as a Republican, so he's probably pro-life, uh, anti-abortion, presumably. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know enough to weigh in on that. I know that God is good, and uh, and He uses all things uh, 
for for the for the good of those who fear him and love him and are called according to their purposes, right? So uh even this, I think, even even in election results I see hope in because well, I mean God God also judges nations, I'm just saying, and he uses governments to do it. So that's a whole nother whole nother controversial podcast that we could do. Uh let's see here. Oh, <laughs> why is the B backwards and but the evil? Look at that. You are very see evil is right and B is back. It's because the B on my hat is actually backwards. It's uh it's a it's a hat I bought uh a, a year or so ago that I just like. It's a backwards Boston B. And it, it's actually a great conversation starter. Um I had a guy come up to me at the at one of the airports. I forget where I was probably I don't even remember, but uh I'm standing there on the phone off to the side just waiting for waiting for my seat to get called or whatever my boarding whatever and he came up to me and he's like excuse me and i said yeah hey oh yeah and he's like please tell me the b on your hat is backwards and i said yeah oh no i know he is and he's like good i thought i was having a stroke <laughs> so i mean uh yeah anyways but normally like people will see and i say the world's backwards but it's being made right you want to know about it so i use it as a conversation starter um it gets attention uh, it's a it, it's it's a limited run. I didn't make it. I bought it from uh, it's a new era hat, um, nine nine fifty new era hat, and it's uh they they did major market teams. Then they printed their their logos backwards. Uh, some of them I don't know which ones. I don't this one is it's you can't buy it from new era anymore. You can find it online on Etsy and stuff like that. But anyways, you're not going crazy. It's backwards. Uh, <laughs> you guys are funny here with this uh uh all right guys i think let me see i just want to scroll up just to see i didn't make sure yeah that that the center the fetterman question sorry guys i just don't um you know i i'm thinking about this it, the this question too uh, like it's it's there's a burden of proof issue here too um it doesn't it doesn't say like i mean why is it why personhood and what what what's by what standard it comes to by what standard you know why does whatever value you're wanting to ascribe what, what that benchmark sorry i'm tripping over my words here but that benchmark that the person that you're talking to is going to set boom it's consciousness it's being able to feel pain it's a heartbeat these things like why is that the benchmark like where have you come up with that and what about the exceptions you know because people use exceptions to us all the time you know and certainly this what about the case of rape incest health of the mother right these are the outliers these are the these are less than one percent so use the exceptions to the rule like well what about the what about the baby that i mean we that's born without a brain and and peter sanger argues that that's a that's a human being by the way like if you guys like this is another another point i don't mean to, to delve into this but just becoming informed like if you read thompson i forget her first name but if you read thompson's violinist argument you read her on this stuff she admits she admits that the unborn is is not only human but a person so the the discussion is where this guy and that's from that's from 50 years ago you know the discussion is going uh, to I know it's a human, I know it's a person, I don't care. That's where the conversation is going, and that's where we need to be equipped and prepared to answer that person. The, kind of the apathy issue, and that's one of the hardest things to to get past. But the problem is, is that they do care, and that's where I would go. I'd say, no, I think you do care because I'm watching how you live your life, and it seems to me like you notice the difference between a child and a tree, and a tree and a and a cockroach. Like, why is that? Because you care, because you see that there's something special about a child, uh, uh, then you, and you can distinguish that from a tree or a cockroach. You know, that's why we, the, Greg says in his presentation on abortion, that's why we, we gas termites and not Jews. You know, everybody, everybody knows that that's wrong. Why? You know, so just because we say, oh, I don't care, just kill. That's what I would have said as an atheist 15 years ago, 16 years ago. If we were talking about abortion, I would have said, yeah, I know it's a human being and know it's a person. I just don't care. Do whatever you want. You know, but that was like, I was sliding into my, I was really trying to live into my atheism, my naturalism. And, um, 
And when you ask me by what standard, I'd say there is no standard outside of yourself. There is no standard outside of yourself. And, and then when I started living that out, um, it didn't, it didn't go, it didn't go well, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, only by the grace of God, uh, did he save me from all that. So, um, anyways, just a side note on that. I was just thinking as I was going through these comments again, um, with that guys, Hey, it's, it's one o'clock here, my time, which is the correct time because it's the West coast time now. Um, Let's uh let's make sure you guys. I just want to make sure you guys pay attention to the to the links that Harmony is putting up because I'm looking at these and like she's linking to some really great stuff. Greg's response to the violinist argument is there. It's fantastic. Um, she's linked to STRU. She's linked to all these things. <clears throat> uh, make sure you check those out. Uh, go to the str.org website for blogs. We have so many blogs on so many different topics and issues, and uh, yeah. So with that, guys, it's uh, it's great to be with you, and I will be uh, do two weeks. Two weeks, we'll be doing another to the point, and I look forward to it. I hope that this has been profitable for you guys, and I'll see you guys. Uh, I'll see you guys then. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you then. Bye bye.